So we are speaking to David Chilton, the author of The Wealthy Barber and The Wealthy Barber Returns, who is coming to Barry in April um, to have a breakfast meeting and give a talk. And we'll talk about tickets in a second. Um, David, congratulations. You're going to be the new dragon on the Dragon's Den. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. I really am. I love the show. And so when the opportunity came up, I was, I was pumped up, truthfully, about trying and seeing how it worked out. And we got everything settled quite quickly in terms of rescheduling different things. And CBC has been great to deal with. And so have been the other people that were affected by this. So it, it really is exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Are you nervous? Not really. I, I, a little bit I was last week when it first was announced and the reaction and everything. I didn't realize just how big the show was until I saw the reaction to the announcement, even from friends and family. They were over the moon. I've never seen my daughter so excited. She couldn't care less that I wrote The Wealthy Barber. Couldn't <laughs> care less. But now I'm on Dragon's Den. She's all pumped up, and it's funny because I said, you know The Wealthy Barber did well. She goes, oh, Dad, that's a book. It's TV. <laughs> Is it nervous to take your money and, and put it behind people that just are walking in front of you for the first time? Yeah, a little bit, sure. No doubt about it. And, uh, you know, and I've done a lot of that in the past and, and certainly got involved with Janet and Greta Podleski and the Looney Spoons front. But, yeah, you, you, I mean, it is your own money, and I think the public needs to know there's nothing fake about that at all. You're writing a check with your own money. It's unscripted, and you've got to make relatively quick decisions, et cetera. But, you know, I, I tend to trust my instincts a lot in those cases and, and look for people with great passion, and the idea has to be somewhat unique and protectable against competition. That's one of the hardest parts for a lot of the pitchers is they have good concepts. And they might even have the ability to execute well, but can they stave off the competition? Is there anything about the idea that builds a moat around it so that others can't basically duplicate the same thing? That's a tricky one. David Children, the author of uh, Wealthy Barber Returns, is coming to speak in Barrie uh, Wednesday, April the 11th. I took a quick poll of my coworkers here to ask them if you had um, a financial guru in front of you, what would you ask? And everyone's initial reaction was, <laughs> but they actually all had some really good questions, so I'm going to ask you a couple of them. Sure. If people get a tax refund back, should they um, put it towards their RRSPs or maybe make an extra mortgage payment or something else they haven't even considered? Let's go with the first two. If you put it in the RSP, that's great. You'll get a tax rebate again next year, obviously, for making that contribution, but also putting it against mortgage is a fine move. You're paying off non-deductible interest. So one of the things I love about paying off non-deductible debt is you can't screw it up. So few of us are good investors, and that's one investment that's very straightforward to do. So I, I like both routes, frankly. I think in, in this environment with very low interest rates and with a very choppy stock market, it's tough to predict, always tough to predict, but either one of those moves for most Canadians is a good one. And, of course, the TFSA is another option people should look at. The, whether or not the TFSA is better or worse than the RSP is a tough calculation, tough to talk about over the radio, but it's certainly worth a look to see. And the key thing is to save it. One of the big problems we have in Canada is that people put the money in the RSP, they get the tax refund, they spend it. Mm -hmm. Remember, you still owe taxes on that RSP when it comes out eventually. So you want to keep saving that money and do something good with it, and you've come up with some of the better options. Um, you talk about interest rates. Somebody here has a variable mortgage, and they want to know if they should be locking in. I'd be pretty tempted. I mean, it's fairly tough not to lock in. You've also seen the spread between the variable rate and the fixed rate narrow. We've now got the 10-year mortgage is offering competitive rates too, so it's tempting to lock in for either the five-year term or the 10-year. I think you're seeing the economy in the states pick up a little bit, and that may give the central bank down there some latitude to raise rates, and of course we would follow along with that. So if inflation ever grabs hold, and, and that's what bankers are trying for throughout the world, central bankers, you may see rates head up a little bit. And with all the debt out there, you've got to think that's going to happen at some point. So I, I really think locking in makes a lot of sense. In the general, it's been better to go variable rate over the last uh, X number of years because, of course, rates have been declining. And you've also made the spread, and people who've gone variable rate have much, done much better than people who've locked the rate in as they've gone along. But I think in this case, it may be better to go with the five and maybe even look at the ten. You're getting a fist pump in here for your answer. <laughs> we know that we're supposed to put money in our RRSPs, but in our RRSPs, it's supposed to be invested inside of something else, and we're not entirely sure about the next step once we've got it in the RRSPs. Well, that's a tough one because the answer varies dramatically from person to person, you know, depending on their risk tolerance level, their other assets, their age, all kinds of things. So no one blanket answer there is going to be appropriate for all the listeners out there. Uh, for example, if you were very young and you felt you were going to have the money inside the RRSP for 45, 50 years, then I still think having a good portion of it invested in stocks makes a lot of sense. Uh, that yes, they go up and down, they are frightening at times, the volatility is not fun to deal with, but over the very, very long term, 
I think they'll provide the best rate of return. They have in the past, but I think they will in the future. In essence, it's a bet on human ingenuity and creativity and capitalism, and I think over extended time frames, that's a good bet. Now, conversely, if you're quite old and you're nearing retirement, you may want to go more conservative, especially if you have uh, no other income, for example. You have no pension. And so every situation is different enough that you need to get some individual counsel and kind of think it through. And I mentioned earlier people's risk tolerance levels vary dramatically. Some people cannot sleep at night if they have risk in their portfolio. That has to be factored in as well. We have um, someone here whose husband thinks that their savings should be going into the kids' education, and she wants it in their retirement. Could you save their marriage? <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you, you wrote know, two books, man. <laughs> I get this question a lot, interestingly, in fact, and not so much just the question, but people send me their financial plans, and I'll look through, and this is a dilemma a lot of Canadians are facing. It's tough to do all this stuff. So you get uh, people like Dave Chilton on stage saying, hey, shorten your amortization, max your RSP, save 10%, pay off your non-deductible debt, do all this stuff. It's tough to do it all. And this is a classic example of how we have to prioritize. Do you go with the kids' education plan? A very good move, by the way. RESPs are now much more flexible than they used to be. You've got the government tax grant. There's all kinds of positives. Or do you fund your own retirement savings plan and or TFSA? And, again, it's a family values question. You're trying to strike balances. There's no definitive answer. I would say this, though. In the majority of instances I see, I personally wish people were leaning a little bit more toward their own retirement savings because so many couples out there now have no defined pension plan involvement, neither the husband nor the wife. They have to save a lot of money to have an even reasonably good retirement. And because so many of us start late, it's human nature to procrastinate, they're behind the eight ball. And I think the way to make up for that is to increase savings now. Do you want your kids coming out of university or college debt laden? Of course not. But I'd rather people head into retirement in a relatively good position. It's, it, that's a tough one, by the way, and you do see it a lot. Our coworkers are so good. They all thought they had terrible questions, but they actually had very good ones. What about people who are going, TFSA, RRSP, RESP, what? I can't even pay my bills. What about people who don't think they have a disposable, who have no disposable income? Well, there's no answer to that one. And, you know, it's interesting. We do have a lot of people in that position. We really do. You've had income stagnating on an after-inflation basis in Canada for quite some time in certain geographical regions and certain industrial pockets. And I'm with those people. It's more important to survive than it is to start planning for your future with real estate prices having edged up with value-added taxes having been introduced in Canada over the last 20 and 25 years. We've now got oil costs up, and, of course, that drags gas costs up, and, frankly, the cost of most other products up. Utilities have gone up in cost. There are a lot of people out there, especially if they're single, have gone through a divorce, whatever, where they are having trouble making ends meet, literally. And they're not being undisciplined. They're not being cavalier. They're not over-consuming. I mean, I see a lot of these plans. They're doing a lot of things well, but they're having trouble setting aside money, and there's no magical answer. This still comes down to relatively basic arithmetic. You try to spend less than you make and invest that difference for good long-term goals. But if there is no difference, there's nothing you can really do. And, I mean, I hate to come on and say you've got to look for a second income, et cetera. That's the typical answer because that's not easy to do. I mean, a second income means getting someone to cover off the kids in some instances and more transportation costs. So uh, the fact of the matter is low-income Canadians are very challenged by trying to set aside something for their future. We do have some safety nets with Canada Pension Plan, OAS, maybe the GIS, but it's certainly not a great living in retirement. And as I said in the book, one of the challenges you have is that a lot of the low-income Canadians, of course, are renting, and therefore that rent cost continues in retirement as well. So no easy answers there. I'm very sympathetic to the plight of those people, and I get annoyed when people out there uh, more or less say that a lot of the careless spending is, is leading to all the challenges and saving. That's certainly true of some middle-income and high-income people, but there are a lot of low-income Canadians who are not carelessly spending their money at all. They just can't do it on their income. David Chilton, author of um, The Wealthy Barber and The Wealthy Barber Returns, is speaking in Barrie at a breakfast meeting Wednesday, April the 11th. Uh, and people can contact me because the details are a little um, varied. So Meg at the docfm.com and I'll tell you how to get those tickets. Our last question was, um, we wanted to know why The Wealthy Barber? Why the title? Yeah. Well, the first book was about a barber. It was a fictional approach about a barber who, who was from Sarnia, Ontario, and well, he cut people's hair. He taught them how to manage their finances to end up in the same position he did, which was quite well off, even though he came from a modest income background. The original title was The Wealthy Bartender. But, of course, <laughs> writing a story about the bar led to, you know, all kinds of things, partying and excessive drinking and everything else. So I moved it from the bar over to the barber shop, and I'm glad I did. You know, obviously, it was the only good idea I've ever had in my life, but I'm <laughs> glad I had it when I was young. 
and uh, it ended up uh, doing good things, and it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed the whole Wealthy Barber process. I've been very spoiled because of the success of the book, and it led me to get involved with the Looney Spoon Sisters and a few other things. Luck has played a very important role in my life, I'm happy to say. David Chilton will be watching you on the Dragon's Den in September. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for your time this morning.